Thank you very much, Julie. That's a lovely introduction um, and a very helpful place to start. I will be better at seeing people's eyes if I stand up, so if you will permit me. Uh, I regret that I must speak to you in my own language. I hope that won't be uh, too inconvenient for people. If we're going to talk about European governance and the internet, which is what I was so generously asked to come to San Sebastian to do, uh, you know, of course, that in my hometown newspaper, the New York Times, you are now the citizens of the coolest place in Europe, the most wonderful city. So I was very lucky to be invited to come and speak here about something I might know about, namely the internet, and something about which I'm not entitled to an opinion, European governance, but I shall try. Uh, the best place to begin, I think, is to back up before the internet uh, to something written around the time that I was being born uh, when a professor of philosophy at Oxford University called Isaiah Berlin was trying to understand in 20th century terms what freedom is. And in 1958, he gave a lecture on two concepts of liberty in which he defined a freedom to and a freedom from, which I stole for the title of this talk, Professor Berlin wanted to point out the way in which uh, the concept of liberty or freedom in Western political thinking really embodied two ideas, a freedom from interference, a zone which belongs to us, which we accept that no power should be able to invade, and a freedom too, that is a positive freedom to become uh, whatever it is that we wish to become, to be the captains of our own ship, the leaders of our own fate. The question that comes in the first kind of freedom is what zone of my life is the state not allowed to interfere with? Where have I got rights? to be free of interference. The question that arises with respect to freedom too is who governs me? Who determines what my fate is in the world other than myself? For Professor Berlin, the point of this philosophical distinction was to reinforce, as he spent his life doing, the difference between revolutionary utopian ideas about politics, which believed in the changing of human nature in some new direction, and those conservative or libertarian ideas which set a zone around the individual of protection and safety. In his two concepts of liberty, uh, uh, Berlin described the way in which that idea of the private space grows with modernity. It isn't a Greek or a Latin idea. It isn't part of the traditions of the Jewish people, his and mine. It's not part of the traditional thinking about the relationship between power and the individual. It is a uniquely modern idea, an idea coming from what we call humanism, the putting of the individual at the center of the social project. But for all that it is the more modern idea, it is also the one to which we aspire most deeply, most universally if you like. And so let me begin then by borrowing Professor Berlin's distinction to discuss what European governance is from my distant point of view. The post-war European political system, which I regret to say is dying now, we can all feel it, we don't want to go to the funeral because we fear the fighting that will come after the funeral, and we're right to fear it, but yet we can see that this order is dying before our eyes. It is dying, in my personal judgment, because it located those two spheres of freedom incorrectly. 
the freedom too, the element of freedom which is to become what one wishes to become, to be the captain of one's fate, was located in this European order, this European project, in the national governments, whose powers over education and health and welfare were the components out of which the positive freedom of their citizens were made. And European citizens, voters, have been deciding on the quality of their freedom too at the national level throughout this post-war European project. The freedom from level, the protection of individual privacy and autonomy from the state, was located by this European order at the level of human rights. It was located too high in that sense to be purely European. What Strasbourg told us were the rights of Europeans were the rights of everybody. And everybody turned out to be too many people because it includes Syrian refugees and Afghani people and people from South Central Africa and so on. That is to say, at the end, the European project located both freedom to and freedom from, but it located freedom to at the national level and it located freedom from at the level of internationally uniform human rights. There was no place in which freedom was located in a specifically European condition. As a consequence of which now, as social tension rises and political polarization rises around the world because of the crisis of globalized capitalism, because of the end of the Cold War and the resumption of more directly confrontational politics in many parts of the world, there is no way in which any European person thinks of her or his rights as European in character. They're either national or they're human, but they're not European. And so as people look around to locate their allegiance, which follows rights, their allegiances do not lead them to, let us say, Brussels or any conceivable Brussels, any Strasbourg, any place where a European entity exists to make their rights just for purposes of comparison. North Americans, particularly citizens of the United States, locate their rights in a national government which also offers freedom from in a purely constitutional sense. The governments are governments of limited powers, and an American identifies her freedom with the American Constitution, not with Alabama and not with human rights, but at the level of the union of which she is a citizen and to which she looks for protection both of her freedom to and her freedom from. I, I have said this mostly in order to describe the failure of the European project through which we are now uncomfortably living. We are in stage one. We know that stage two will be more uncomfortable, but we live now in stage one of the failure of the project. And I have suggested that its failure is a theoretical failure. It has failed to offer that European project rights, freedoms, liberties to or from, and has afforded instead patronage and public-private partnerships and some money for the French and some money for the Germans and a little bit left over for everybody else. Um, but it has not offered that dignity of the underwriting of human freedom, which is the project it claims to be part of. When we ask what is wrong with Europe, they whistle Beethoven's Ode to Joy and we're supposed to remember then that this is a European project, freedom, but truthfully, it hasn't worked out that way. Now, all of that is to get us to the internet, of course, which is what I work on and what everybody came here to listen to. They don't have to be all about Isaiah Berlin. We can be instead about Google, but when we get there, we will have gotten there, I think, by a better route for that beginning, uh, what, what, what in a major way the commission presently offers uh, by way of an idea of uh, European rights 
is privacy. It's surprising, is it not, how important that suddenly is. Uh, and the privacy that it offers really is freedom from Google. But people don't want freedom from Google. They want freedom to have the great convenience of the system, which reads their email and fills in their calendar and keeps them in touch with the people they went to grade school with and all of that. Um, all of the convenience of that internet way of life, that total connection to everybody from everybody else, that's a freedom too that people require now, need, don't really understand how to live without. And the freedom from, well, that's now defined as the right to be forgotten, you know. Uh, it's defined as the right to truncate memory. It's the right to get some foreign corporation which offers you convenience, not also to keep too much track of you. It's an unfortunately incoherent promise, uh, and it winds up, in my judgment, simply repeating the difficulty of political theory I was pointing out in the beginning. The Commission's way of ruling Europe, if there is a Europe for it to rule, it involves giving you freedom from things you'd rather keep uh, and freedom to be tracked and monitored, uh, as Yuli was saying, in ways that you don't want and aren't supposed to be conscious of. So now let us come to what it is that's really happening in the internet, wherever that is. What's really happening is that we are getting a net that studies human behavior in order to predict yours. Yours collectively and yours individually. The purpose of the net is changing. It was, it is true, for a while to inform you, to offer you new ways of growing your lives, to provide new ways of doing business and learning and existing in the world. But that is changing very rapidly. We are now wiring up the other half of the human race, the poorer half, the half that, unlike you and me, doesn't have a lot of income. Uh, but we are wiring it up anyway because it behaves, and predicting its behavior is valuable and profitable. The most scarce resource in the world now is human attention, and it is fought for by capitalist entities in a very powerful way because it makes money, to be blunt about it. Human attention sells pharmaceuticals, creates tourism, makes food and uh, housing and schooling decisions. Human attention is what drives the economy of now. We are about consumption, not about production. When the gross domestic product of the United States reached 70% consumption and only 30% production at the beginning of the 21st century, capitalism began to study consumers. Industrial capitalism of the 20th century studied production. It studied the stuff that was its raw material and how to make it into the stuff that was its finished products at lowest cost. What 20th century industry used computers for was making production smarter. What 21st century capitalism uses computers for is to be smarter than consumers to know more about them than they know about themselves. You study the thing you make your money from, and they make their money from your behavior. So the net becomes a place where behavior is studied so it can be predicted several trillion times a day. The network that we now have, the network which is centered at Google and Facebook and Twitter and all the other services that you use, several trillion times a day, that network makes experiments with human beings. Stimulus, response, swipe left, swipe right, click, don't click, buy, shop, don't buy. Those decisions that human beings make, we forget almost immediately. 
Did you swipe left or did you swipe right? By the next morning, it doesn't matter anymore. You've forgotten. All the ones on which you swiped, whichever way it was, you barely remember. But the machine remembers. It remembers forever. It remembers everything everybody did yesterday. And it makes judgments accordingly. The machine, the network we are building, the one that we don't want, this machine is a behaviorist. Like B.F. Skinner, the American psychologist who created the idea of behaviorism in the middle of the 20th century, the machine inside which we now live has no need for a conception of human mind. Skinner's behaviorism was a way of doing psychology without mind. Its idea was there's just stimulus and response. You just correlate stimulus and response, stimulus and response. You don't need a conception of the mind behind. You can realistically just watch what happens. You apply this and that occurs. It is, after all, Isaiah Berlin would have said, one of those mechanistic conceptions of human nature which reduce sociology to physics, which create a science of human behavior, laws of how human beings are. That's the network we have, the one that uh, Yule refers to as the monitoring network. We think of it as the one giving us freedom to, freedom to do whatever learning, whatever working, whatever selling, whatever celebrating, whatever sexualizing we want. It's the machine which gives us what we want. From the perspective of the consumer then, the real purpose of the machine is hidden. The real purpose of the machine is transcending the nature of the human mind, changing what human thought processes are for. In Manhattan, where I live, people also walk, as I see them walk around San Sebastian. But every day now in Manhattan, I watch people nearly killed because they are wearing earphones and they are typing and they step into the street which is a bigger street than your streets with more cars in it and something nearly happens. Ten, six, eight times a day I watch this occur now because people are losing their sense of place because they are always in a space between here and here because their lives are now being lived, their brains are now being adjusted to interaction mediated by the machine. And interaction mediated by the machine is now realer to them than the car heading towards them in the street. That's a great achievement on the part of the machine. It's a great achievement on the part of capitalism. It's reshaping reality very fast, simultaneously, one human being at a time, except it's a lot of human beings all at once. To this, what is the European response? Well, actually it is sue Google over something irrelevant. Spend 20 years at it, rinse, repeat. That's privacy law, according to the commission, according to the data protection officers scattered around the continent, all of them engaged in what they call a human rights activity. Uh, which is, I, I agree it is. I mean, it's a, it's a rear guard action on behalf of humanity, but it's not very effective. It, it begs a question, one which I have heard in Brussels many a time, you know, in one of those little private places where Europe is actually governed. Why don't we have a European Google, they say? Why don't we have a European Twitter? Why don't we have a European Facebook? Um, and, and this is a peculiar question from my point of view. Not, not because its answer is peculiar, but it, because it's so obviously the wrong thing to ask. Um, it, it does represent a capitalist aspiration. Europe would be a better Europe if it had a Google of its own. Look at Tsar Vladimir. He has a Yandex. He doesn't need a Google. He has a V-Contact, or a VK as it's now called. Why should he have a Facebook? But of course, what we really mean is that Yandex and VK are tools of despotism designed to keep the Russian population watching television and geared to the reality that Tsar Vladimir wishes them to believe is real. 
It's a tool for the reduction of reality to one person's view of the matter. Tsar Vladimir doesn't want the machine. Xi Jinping does, but he wants it to be a Chinese machine. The conduct of Chinese despotism in the 21st century is all about data mining. The Chinese government is the leading government in the world and moving towards the citizen score, the, the, the number which defines how good a citizen you are based on what you say on social media and what you don't say who your friends are and who they aren't, who you're associated with and whom you refuse to associate with. The despotism of the Chinese future is the despotism of data mining by the state, freedom to be free our way. A far more significant corruption of freedom to than the Soviet Union was ever able to produce or than the German Democratic Republic could aspire to. From Berlin's point of view, the despotisms of the 20th century, that is Isaiah Berlin's view, not the city of Berlin's view, what, from Isaiah Berlin's view, the despotisms of the 20th century were places which forced people to be free their way. For Berlin, the primary point was Kant's point, no man may make me free to be the way he prefers. And that was what Marxist and Hegelian and Fichte-like political philosophy had done wrong. That's not the problem of 21st century despotism. The problem of 21st century despotism is be however you want and we will study it and make decisions about you. Why is there no European Facebook? Why is there no European Google? Well, we could locate the answer in the political economy of post-war Europe, what it was good at doing, what it was bad at doing. We can say, well, it's much more important to save industrial jobs than to create data centers. We can say the commission has never really understood why Google existed in the first place. But the primary problem is that there has been no evolution of the net to create either freedom to or freedom from at a European level. Now let me offer a couple of positive suggestions for our uh, common conversation. Um, in many European societies at the moment, old people have jobs protected by law that young people will never have. And young people have no route to good employment that old people are not willing to give up their jobs in order to make easy. This is essentially the French problem of the moment, right? Uh, labor law reform must reduce the security of employment so young people can have some jobs. Then young people go into the street and say, but we don't want crappy jobs like that. We want jobs protected by law to the same extent that our parents' jobs were protected. What does not happen is a way for young people people to make new businesses. If I go to Brussels and I say, look, you should give every European young person a five euro per month personal server and you should put on it all the software that would replace relation to the tax authorities and the licensing authorities and would lower the barriers to making businesses because any young person with a phone would have what it takes to build a new business they will go back to, why don't we have a European Google? And I will say, no, but what you really need is freedom too, freedom of self-actualization in an economy which is squeezing its young people to death. Why are you worried about whether you have a Google when you should be worried about whether you have an accelerator for jobs? I know a young mother in Madrid who has been trying to start a business for years. She knows about free software. She understands the technology of the world, but it offers her no way to make a business because regulation and the power of old ways of work have not lifted themselves for a generation which more than it needs a job needs a way to build a business. This is a European freedom too, which the commission is unable to deal with. It's a form of harmonization of European law that would have been very, very powerful and would have produced a lot of social peace in Europe over the last decade. And it's the missing piece which is going to make the future very much harder than it is right now. Freedom from 
What Mr. Snowden did was to prove that there was no freedom from spying anywhere in Europe. The minute he raised the matter, the chancellor begins to say, don't listen to my phone, as though her phone was the one we really concerned ourselves with. That 49 million people's telephone calls and SMSs in Germany were being sucked up by the US listeners wasn't what seemed to borrow the bother the chancellor. Freedom from listening on her mobile phone was quite important. The freedom from listening of every other German citizen, not so much. And what Mr. Snowden was talking about in 2013 was nothing compared to the world of 2016, now that a few outrages in various European capitals have re-empowered European secret police to spy on everybody at a level not seen since the fall of the Soviet Union. Once again, European government has managed to do everything except create reliable freedoms from in which the citizens of European societies can believe. The European Court of Human Rights said last year that taking every single telephone call and short messaging service message in a society is a violation of fundamental human rights. They said that concerning the Russian plan to take every telephone call and every SMS. And when the judgment was newly announced, Mr. Putin's people in Moscow said, yeah, well, we'll follow it if we feel like it, unless Tsar Vladimir tells us not to, in which case it's not law at all. Which expresses, in a way, the basic difficulty. What Strasbourg had said was something about international human rights everywhere, and what Tsar Vladimir said back is, I run this place, so forget about that. What didn't happen was somebody said, you can't be a European if you don't protect people against listening. If the rule were no listening to citizens here, in a place called Europe, without judicial authorization, then we would be talking about European freedoms from, and I too would get on a boat anywhere on earth to get to that Europe if it existed, if it existed. I used to live in a society which offered me that rule. The United States I grew up in said no listening without judicial authority. That's why Mr. Snowden did what he did to come and tell us that those weren't the rules anymore. So what I want then to pose for our conversation is the proposition that both freedom to and freedom from have new meanings in the world of this net. In this generation, now, as we all step into a world in which the net behaves as an instrumentation designed to point at us, to remember what we're thinking when we search, when we buy, when we swipe left, when we swipe, swipe right, who we like, who we didn't like, what we liked, what we didn't like, all of those things remembered forever as a way both of profiling us as individuals and our portion of the human race as a whole. Are you part of the population between 40 and 43 that likes the white stripes and watches football and drinks vermouth? You're a profile. You're a person to be advertised to in a bunch. Mr. Zuckerberg's job is slicing up the human race into bunches like that so that somebody can send an advertisement to your phone. Is that either freedom to or freedom from in a sense that civilized and empowered people living in one of the richest and best culturally endowed parts of the world should have? I think no. Whatever you think, there is nobody in Brussels thinking about it for you. By whom are you ruled in this question? Mariano Rajoy has no power over this, none. He might as well not exist. Does Margarete Vestager? Does any set of European commissioners, do all of them put together? Or are they somehow also captive to a thing going on in Silicon Valley that they can't interfere with except by suing it and hoping eventually to win? I have spent enough time in Brussels as in Washington DC to understand just how irrelevant the concerns of the administrators usually are. 
And you have spent just enough time at the end of the post-war experiment to watch them recognize their own irrelevance. But nonetheless, they are your rulers and they keep ruling you whether they are irrelevant or not. What is the net to do about that for you? Nothing. It's packaging you up to sell to somebody. You're a profile. In every society that holds so-called free elections, Facebook knows how people are going to vote. They know more about next month's election here than I do. They know more about next month's election here than you do. Is that freedom? Thank you very much. ¿Qué opina del cifrado en las comunicaciones? ¿Está más generalizado de lo que pensamos o se tiene que generalizar más? ¿Cuál es su opinión sobre el cifrado en las comunicaciones? Si está generalizado, si se tiene que generalizar más o menos. So, I've spent a lot of time over the course of my career trying to make sure that there was encryption that everyone could use. I began trying to challenge the rules against exportation of encryption technology in the United States in 1991. It took me until 2000 to win that war. And since that time, the technologies of privacy have been good enough, if people use them, to resist listening by all but what we call national means of intelligence, which we could describe as the United States, the British GCHQ, uh, the Germans with American help, the Russians and the Chinese. If you are up against those particular people, which sometimes we are, uh, encryption may not be enough. But generally speaking, uh, when we obscure what we say using encryption, we get back secrecy, which is one part of privacy. The ability to communicate between us without being overheard by anybody that we don't intend is a critical component of freedom, and encryption gives us that. At the same time that the United States government began in the 1990s to adapt itself to the idea that there would be real secrecy around the world, it began trying to eliminate anonymity, another critical component of our freedom in a digital society. Anonymity is harder to protect, even using encryption, than secrecy is. We can say that you and I can talk in a way that may be difficult for other people to overhear, 
But when you and I try to avoid our identities online, when we try to achieve anonymity there, only encryption will not help us. Even all the encryption that we have may not help us very much. The preservation of anonymity is more important than secrecy in many ways. We think of that primarily as being about the anonymity of speech. Can we say things without being identified? But in the 21st century, that is less important than the preservation of anonymity in reading, which we are losing very fast and which we are not aware of losing very much. Imagine that for the last 500 years, every book had been reporting every reader at headquarters. Imagine that with respect not only to Samizdat in the Soviet Union, or underground reading in occupied France, or even just the anonymity of reading in General Franco's Spain. Imagine that with respect to everywhere, every book reporting every reader. Now you understand why I'm not so fond of Google Books, or reading on Facebook, or any of the other ways in which we have become accustomed to the idea that somebody knows what we are reading. Every time you recommend something on the web through Twitter, Twitter helpfully shortens the URL for you. But what that actually means is that when you recommend something through Twitter, Twitter watches the reading of everybody to whom you've recommended it. You drag them into a surveilled environment, and then their reading of what you've recommended to them is watched by Twitter, which learns more about human behavior in order to sell advertising. The loss of the anonymity of reading is the loss of freedom of the mind. Encryption isn't an answer to this problem. HTTPS www.facebook.com is no safer than HTTP www.facebook.com because in both cases, Facebook knows what you're reading. In fact, this is the real benefit of centralized social networking. People tend to assume that the threat to their privacy is you put stuff on Facebook and then other people know about it. The real threat to privacy is that Facebook knows what you're reading. Facebook workers know who's falling in love with whom faster than they know themselves. Because once you start obsessively checking your beloved's Facebook page, even before you've told him, you've told them. That's why the monitoring and prediction of human behavior is so dangerous. Your police arrested yesterday a man in Barcelona for supporting Muslim extremism because he was blogging in favor of the Islamic State. You can at least say that he was speaking. But next month, your police might be arresting somebody in Barcelona because he was reading too much about the Islamic State. Both President Francois Hollande and Prime Minister David Cameron have at different times in the last 16 months suggested that reading jihadi websites might be in itself supporting terrorism. It is not, of course, only Facebook or only your state which surveils your reading. That's what Mr. Snowden wished to point out. The United States government wishes to surveil all reading which is a pretty serious commitment to totalitarianism, I would have thought. The shape of what protects our freedom is in part encryption, but only in part. Secrecy is only one part of securing our autonomy, which is the real goal of our privacy, to make and live out our decisions without being affected by those who spy on us whether they are spying on us to sell us a different car or a different drug, or whether they are spying on us to decide whether to torture us. Those are 
degrees of difference, not difference in kind, in order to have our autonomy, both our freedom to and our freedom from, we need more than just the ability to write secret messages. I am for encryption very strongly. I am glad you are too. Yes, we should use more of it. No, it won't fix the problem. Adelante, si no tenéis, yo tengo una preparada para hacerle. O sea que aprovecho. Eh, even, yes, put. No, yes, put, put that. I'm going to ask you. Te voy a preguntar. Eh, ahora mismo has dicho que la encriptación está bien, pero que no es suficiente. Y lo relaciono con lo que has estado diciendo anteriormente. Es decir, que da igual lo que los administradores o administradoras digan o intenten hacer. Mi pregunta es, por un lado, ¿qué papel das entonces hoy en día tanto a la civil servants, digamos, ¿no? a la función pública, e incluyo aquí también a los políticos, a la, hora de, eh, a la hora de tomar decisiones y de poder enfrentarte a todo este peligro eh, o totalitarismo que acabamos de llamar? Es decir, ¿das algún papel o crees que la resistencia eh, no va a venir por ahí? Y en todo caso, ¿por dónde puede venir una resistencia a todo esto? Or resistencias. So one of the problems that government officials have is that they too are entrapped in this relationship with the machine. Uh, they can't conduct politics without Facebook and Twitter in the same way that in the post-war world they couldn't conduct politics without television. So for those of them who are responsive to the movements of public opinion, they are now captured by the systems of public opinion on which they depend. In a more radical way, they are the easiest targets of listening. What, what is primarily frightening the professional politicians in Western Europe at the moment is that they realize that they are just as vulnerable as the politicians in the East to their own listeners. As you are probably watching, telephone conversations of people in power are currency of power now. It isn't just a Czech prime minister who has to resign both because of the corruption of his personal chief of staff and because he's sleeping with her. It isn't just a Polish government unhinged by material coming out from its listeners. The politicians of grander and more self-satisfied Western European societies are terrified too. And if you look at the policy concerning listening moving its way through Europe, Western European parliaments now, which appears and is described very much as about terrorism, it is also about a new political deal between frightened politicians and their own listeners. The French military platforms bill, now long since passed by unanimous vote of socialist deputies in the Chamber of Deputies, or the, the Snoopers Charter legislation working its way through the British Parliament at the present moment, is very much about a new political deal with their own listening. We will take the gloves off for you. We will unchain you in listening to Europe's Muslims. And in return for everything we are giving you, we assume that you will not publish our telephone conversations and force us from power. You may be aware that the chief of French military intelligence does not consider himself to work for the French defense minister. The name of the chief of French military intelligence is never published, and there is a, an official argument which has never been adequately discussed in a public way in France about the political responsibility of its listeners. The head of GCHQ in the UK is a very Americanized fellow who didn't go to Eton with David Cameron and wasn't part of the Bullingdon Club and isn't part of the traditional espionage aristocracy of England either. It's a new ball game in which each leader tries to protect himself or herself from listening. If you want to know what they're afraid of, look at contemporary Brasilia, where an entire set of governments, one after the other, are being destroyed by listeners 
recordings of intimate telephone conversations among people in power. So the first thing I would say to you is that the public servants are terrified of the knowledge that they possess that their power is contingently based upon who uses the net to listen to them and who talks about it. They are a little afraid of Mr. Zuckerberg, but they are more afraid of their own secrets. They are afraid of their own secret police. They are negotiating the listening to us in order to protect themselves. This is also, of course, the source of the chancellor's deliberate attempt to confuse listening with her cell phone, to her cell phone by the Americans with listening to all other Germans. It was a rather revelatory moment in a way. The chancellor is more afraid of the Americans listening to her mobile phone than she is afraid of the listening to her entire society because she needs the listening to her entire society. That is the position of the public servants now. They have an irrevocable, possibly irremediable conflict of interest with respect to all of this and they don't know how to resolve it. Let's imagine somehow that we've resolved it. Let's imagine somehow that we have taken the privacy of the politicians and the threats to the privacy of the politicians out of politics. I don't know how that's to happen yet, but let's imagine that we've done it. Now the problem of the public sector in relation to our privacy is that it has become industrial policy for them. It's about economic welfare. Whether they are the United States White House supporting Google, Facebook, and Twitter because they are great new national industries, or whether they are the European Commission attacking those entities under competition law in order to make publicity for themselves, they are fundamentally responding to the new reality of consumer capitalism as something that they have a monetary interest in, in the management of their societies. It's good for business, it's bad for business, it creates growth, it inhibits growth. That's not freedom. That's prosperity, it's very important, but it isn't freedom, it's unprincipled. You do what you have to do in order to survive economically now, in order to get some more people employed, in order to make a trade advantage for yourself, in order in your bilateral negotiations between the European Union and the US to get some of what Hollywood wants so you can have some of what you want, like local content regulation in the culture industries, right? It's trades, it's deals. What I teach in my classroom is that privacy is not transactional, it's ecological. It's more like the regulation of the physical environment than it is like the businesses of consumer services. Here's what I mean. I take great care with my email. I've been using email since I was 14 years old. I wrote email software when I was a teenager. I care about encryption and the privacy of email very much. But 42% of all the people I correspond with use Gmail. That means that Google gets a copy of 42% of my email no matter what I do. If your family has one person in it who uses Yahoo Mail and one person in it who uses Gmail, then Yahoo and Google get a copy of all your family correspondence automatically. The consequence is an ecological decrease in privacy just as reading online through monitored Google Books or Facebook or whatever is an ecological decrease in the freedom of the mind and the ability to think in a private space. So what the public officials get wrong is that they are inevitably engaged in trade. They are doing what my friends Marx and Engels said they do. They are melting down all other human freedoms for the one chartered freedom of free trade. They are compelled to a transactional view 
of human privacy. And even if we could solve their cowardice, even if we could solve their fear that their own listeners can sell them out tomorrow and destroy their careers by publishing their telephone conversations, even if we could take their personal stake out of it, they are still compelled to an institutional analysis which is wrong. That's why I started with Isaiah Berlin. The problem is in the conceptions of freedom, not in the behavior of the government officials. That's the analysis that I'm trying to put forward in response to the question you're asking. Buenas tardes. Mientras le escuchaba, pensaba en los grandes sistemas totalitarios y dictatoriales del siglo XX. Pensaba en el libro de 1986, del gran hermano, de cómo cuando descolgaba un cuadro descubría un micrófono y pensaba que hoy en día, o bueno, o en esos tiempos, mejor dicho, ningún gobierno hubiese imaginado la capacidad de vigilancia ¿no? que, a la que estamos sometidos. ¿Es posible escapar de de esto, hay, hay alternativa no sé si conoce la serie esta americana de Person of, of Interest en la que hay una máquina que lo espía todo, bueno pues al final creo que vivimos algo así no controlados por cada gadget que llevamos esa sería la primera pregunta y la segunda hablaba usted al principio también sobre la tecnología, hasta qué punto forma parte de nuestras vidas de casi biotecnología eh, el juicio este que ha habido eh, con el iPhone en California creo que era en el que el FBI no ha podido acceder al, al contenido del teléfono. ¿Qué, ¿Qué opinión le merece? ¿Está por delante la tecnología de las leyes? De, de qué? ¿O al final es lo mismo? ¿Es la seguridad por la que vendemos todo? Gracias. Two very good questions. Just to begin with George Orwell. Um, in the in Der Spiegel, uh, in the fall of 2014, a Snowden document was discussed, uh, which shows a presentation occurring at the U.S. National Security Agency, our listeners. Uh, it's an internal seminar for analysts at NSA. The title of the seminar is, So Your Target Carries a Smartphone. It's a first course in what to do in using that equipment. There's a slide in Mr. Snowden's uh, stolen presentation. Uh, the slide shows uh, a human face, and it says underneath, who ever thought Big Brother would look like this? The face is the face of Stephen Jobs. Um, the next slide is a photograph taken through the glass roof of one of the Apple stores, these temples that Mr. Jobs built to the god that is himself. A a and there's a whole bunch of people inside lining up to buy iPhones. And the caption under that photograph was, and who thought they could be made to pay for it themselves? So the thing I must tell you is that what George Orwell did not imagine in 1984 uh, is really that people could be made to pay for it themselves. That is, that capitalism could drive surveillance as a product people would buy. If the KGB had tried to hand out iPhones or Android monitoring devices in the Soviet Union, I knew that people would have tied them to dogs, right? They would not have carried them. If the right place had been handing out monitoring equipment, people would not have bought monitoring equipment at $1,000 ago. Right? So this is the great thing that happened that Mr. Orwell didn't see and that you and I can see. That's why we don't live in his world. In his world, Engsoc had to do its spying at its own expense. That's not where we live now. The first cultural entity which shows where we live now is Steven Spielberg's Minority Report to, from 2006. Mr. Spielberg, as is often in his storytelling, had done a lot of research. And he had realized and dramatizes in that movie the fact that commercial surveillance comes first and government comes along behind. 
the, the second point that you raise um, is one which is so important that in my classroom it's always where we start. I teach that law, technology, and politics are the three legs of the stool. You can never do anything without thinking about all three of them. So technology doesn't replace law or politics. They don't replace technology. One must always think about all three. But when you say, is there something we can do, there is something we can do. I, I've spent six years trying to get it done, and it is beginning to happen now. It's a thing I call Freedom Box, which is not a box, but just some software that everybody can share, which runs on tiny little objects that are very cheap. There are a lot of little things we call single board computers now. They're in schools, they're in homes, they're in businesses. They're tiny little objects that cost 50, 60, 70 euro, and that will ultimately cost 20, 30, 40 euro. And they are as good a computer as any other computer that existed in the world that I grew up in working as a computer programmer. They're fine little servers. They can be used as privacy appliances. Let us say you buy a, a, a Raspberry Pi or some other little computer and you pay 70 euro for it. You bring it home and you put some software inside it. It replaces your wireless router. It does the same job that your wireless router is doing. That is, it allows you to connect your stuff to the network. But what else is it doing? It's taking all the ads off everything. It's removing all the tracking bugs from every web page that you take. It's making sure that you have encryption on your email. It's using Tor automatically to control who can see your location in the net. It's doing all the things which services would do for you if the services weren't run by people who don't have your interests at heart. It's the closest object in the net to you, and it's working for you instead of for them. I gave a speech in Berlin two weeks ago at one of the finest new media conferences in the world, an annual event called Republica in Berlin. And they invited me back to give a keynote speech because I had given one in 2012 about this question of the anonymity of reading. And it was the worst keynote speech ever given because I depressed everybody so much. My partner, Ms. Chaudhry, and I, uh, my law partner, we, we gave this speech together and we said, by 2025, everybody in the world will have been hooked up to the net we don't want. The title of that talk was The Last Kilometer, The Last Chance. Because the last hop in the net before it reaches your eyeball or your eardrum is our last opportunity to put something in the way of surveillance and monitoring. We can make those somethings very cheaply because the systems of manufacturing in the world are tur turning out wonderful cheap computers that everybody can afford. And we can put software in them that costs nothing and that everybody can share. And we can make privacy protection appliances which live near you. I like to say in India, where we are making some of this software, that any human being in the world who can afford any kind of home at all can afford to have first class privacy in that home. So that's what we will do on the technical side. We will make very cheap, very good technology that other people build for us and distribute in hundreds of millions of units around the world that you can buy cheaply, just plug in, and it will help. It won't fix everything, but it will help. Once you have a number of people in society, let's call them voters, who want to do things like that, then there will be other people who will have to listen. I have explained to you why even a person who lives in a government job might want one of those boxes of her own. That is to say, it might help her even with her own secret police, let alone with other people's secret police. We can produce a product we call privacy. We can distribute it in a non-capitalist way. We can prevent that technology from being obliterated by the profit motive. That's not everything, but it's a good thing. I woke up one morning some years ago and I thought to myself, Eben, you are so smart. Sometime during the night, you have figured out why capitalism produces inferior technology. 
Because sometime during the night it occurred to you while you were asleep that every time the profit motive conflicts with technological superiority, capitalism chooses profit. And therefore, there is always a fixed area of difference between the technology we could have and the technology the profit motive will deliver. And I was very proud of myself. And then a couple of months later, I was reading the journals of Rosa Luxemburg looking for something completely other. And I came across a thing that she wrote not very long before they killed her and dropped her in the river in Berlin. And Rosa Luxemburg says, capitalism produces inferior technology because every time the profit motive interferes with technological excellence, capitalism has to choose profit. And so when we have socialism, you will wait and see what wonderful technology we have. And then I thought to myself, I'm not smart, I'm just lucky. Nobody's trying to murder me and throw me in the river for thinking <laughs> yet, right? Um, so, so we can improve the technology, okay? We get a little bit away from profit. We look at what it is that capitalism is compelled to produce because of its ceaseless energy of production. We try and hack that to turn it in the correct technological direction. And then we try and share that with people in order to help them get better privacy. We hope that in doing that, we have a secondary effect on politics and law. If the European Commission really wants to stop Google from spying, they should hand out these devices. Maybe they should also put some stuff in there that helps young people to start businesses, et cetera, et cetera. I won't go back to it again. In other words, technology and profit have to be dissociated somewhat. You would think that that would be the role of a European government forcing more freedom to and more freedom from on behalf of its citizens. But the technological, like the legal and political creativity of the European Union, is played out. It has no new inventing to do, which is why it is a decadent system falling apart before our eyes. Buenas tardes. A ver si, si, lo entiendo, si lo entiendo bien, ¿no? Si la sensación que tengo es que el mensaje, más allá de pesimista, es la sensación es que debemos claudicar de defender nuestros derechos fundamentales de forma tradicional, es decir, acudir a los, al legislador para que legisle conforme considera el pueblo o acudir a los tribunales. Y por defecto, en vez de claudicar de esta forma, hacerlo a través del, del código, es decir, como dijo Lessig, ¿no? que el código es la ley, es decir, utilizar sistemas que nos permitan defender esos derechos fundamentales en una sociedad que, como está usted en este momento comentando, prácticamente eh, no se defiende en, de la forma tradicional porque el propio sistema ya se, ya se dedica en sí mismo a, a controlar y a defenderse de, por sí mismo. ¿no? Y una segunda pregunta que ya no, no tiene nada que ver en esto… En, no sé si ha estado al día, que entiendo que sí, con la sentencia en este caso de Google y Oracle. ¿Qué opinión tiene de las discusiones que se están generando hoy en día sobre esto mismo, sobre incluso la, la protección de las APIs y bueno, eh, lo que está sucediendo? Gracias. So, those are two very good questions, one of which everybody cares about and one of which almost nobody cares about because they didn't understand it. Um, I'm going to answer both of them, but permit me to take more time on the first one. Um, so, uh, I would say you have it right um, because I'm doing it wrong. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm just being pessimistic again and it's therefore going to be a terrible speech. So, thank you for reminding me to, to make sure that everybody doesn't think I'm completely pessimistic just because I think the European order is dying. Um, uh, on the one hand, yes, you're right. Uh, I, like my dear friend Larry Lessig, believe that code is sometimes law. Uh, that is, Freedom Box is a way of making facts on the ground, if you like, making technical realities that then everybody else has to cope with, but then it all has to be coped with. I'm not an engineer primarily. Uh, I'm not even a historian primarily. I'm a lawyer primarily. I like to get things done in society using words, which is how lawyering is defined in my classroom. So I am in favor of holding democracy's feet to the fire. I am in favor of making judges do their work. I'm in favor of the rule of law protects that which is most important to us, our freedom, 
freedoms to and freedoms from. I do not wish to relent on any of these fronts. I believe that relenting anywhere is giving up everywhere. So the modification I would make is not to your question, but to my previous remarks. You, you had me right, and I have to stop being quite so pessimistic. Uh, can we win on all fronts all the time? No. If we don't fight on all fronts all the time, how often will we win? Not very. So we had better do as much as we can, and maybe that will be enough, and I can give some reasons why. Uh, on the other hand, you asked a different question, too, about the war between Google and Oracle, which I have indeed been very close to since before it began. Um, and what I will tell you is it makes absolutely no difference whatever. From a legal point of view, what is happening is fact-bound. That is to say, it's about some very special facts. And like all other fair use in copyright decisions in the United States, it's just about this thing. It won't generalize well. It's a very extreme case in every other sense. Second, it's really a discussion about money between two sets of people who have a great deal of money. In the end, it will settle where it needed to settle. To get jargonized for a moment, I went and told the United States Supreme Court when Google and Oracle first got there, don't pay any attention to this case. It's not important. Google could always have used Java under GPL2, and it would have been fine. The, uh, Poo-pooing that went on didn't work very well. First, the United States Supreme Court didn't take the case. I was grateful. I thought they were right that I was right. And then Google announced, well, we're just going to use Java under GPL, and so everything will settle. What is really going on now, I believe, I have no inside information, is that Oracle is saying, but you can't use it under GPL because you violated GPL back in the old days, so pay us money now because GPL2 says your license automatically terminated. It's a competition about money. Mr. Ellison doesn't like losing competitions about money, but he's very greedy. And so he will take almost any money he is given. One day, Google will wake up, and they will throw a bone to the dog, and the dog will go home, and it will be over. And when that happens, the way American law works, there will be no precedent anymore because it's settled. So I would say to you, don't worry about it. APIs are still probably not copyrightable under US copyright law. That hasn't changed in this case. That isn't going to change because of this case. The fair use decision, which was made by the jury in California, is very nice. I'm very happy. I like fair use. The more fair use there is, the better we are. But all of this is really going to be resolved because Safra Katz is going to get a little bag of cash from Sundar Pichai. And when that happens, it'll all evaporate as though it had never been. Everybody else will now forgive me for saying all those things, but I was asked a question. I should give an answer. I would definitely agree that I don't think Europe is facing its shining moment, uh, various crises indeed. Uh, but to sort of focus on a constructive future, if one could be imagined, what feasible versions of freedom do you think multi-level governance in Europe today is, is primed uh, to realize and to put forth? Well, the beauty of the current situation, as you notice when you look at the people who run Europe, is that they're older even than I am which means they won't be around too much longer, which means that some form of generational transition in how European government thinks about itself is now biologically inevitable. The primary problem, as you see, is that things are falling apart faster than they personally are. Right? Um, but, but that might change, right? I mean, we might narrowly escape, as we narrowly escape the nuclear destruction of the Northern Hemisphere, uh, and, and if we escape, then there will come a moment at which the people trying to operate this system are no longer the, the generation which sees it as an alternative to the Second World War. The second ace in the hole is Tsar Vladimir. Uh, he is the worst government that can be imagined, really. 
Um, and his government is not only extremely bad, it is extremely truculent and corrupt beyond all human measurement. And so he poses a challenge to Europe that Europe can now understand better. It is not tanks in the Fulda Gap. It is not nuclear weapons. It is giving away anti-aircraft missiles to stupid people who shoot down Dutch airliners and cause enormous ruckus and trouble. It is submarines testing everybody against the Arctic. And it is a very clear example of illiberal human future. That it attracts Viktor Orban is in itself, good news in a way. You know what you're up against. Nobody is fooled about this. Illiberalism is entering the heart of Europe, and it is there, and a government must find a way to deal with it at a European level. It is an existential crisis for the European idea. Something will happen if the people change. Nothing will happen if the people don't change because they are a class of government hoping that it will last out their time. Après moi la déluge is pretty much the Brussels-Luxembourg way of viewing the situation, right? And so the positive future is transition occurs. The positive future is young people decide not to trust anyone under 60 or 40 or 50 or it won't matter. Young, the Junkers of the world have to retire at any number that they choose. But youth must be served, right? Uh, national governments with, uh, with approval levels at 13, 14 percent, they, they will give way to something, either something good or something terrible, right? And everybody knows that this is where we now live, right? People, people can see Marine Le Pen. They know she's there. People can see Viktor Orban. They know he's there. The, the, the nature of the strain is obvious. And the nature of the response, if it were really democratic, would be good. But if you want me to predict confidently that the young people of Europe are going to force a demographic transition in time, I can't do it. I can't do it. It isn't obvious that that's about to happen. It isn't obvious that it can happen without something catastrophic happening first. The First World War destroyed a lot of governments and created a transition demographically and generationally in European government, but it had traumatized the populations through which it moved to the point at which what replaced them was unhealthier than what was destroyed. We can assume that important change is coming. We cannot assume that it will be fast enough to be in the right direction, and the forces of darkness are already on the field. Qué bien, ¿eh? <risa> bueno, no hay más preguntas. Si hay más preguntas, pero si no puedo hacer yo y no. Hola, buenas, buenas tardes. Eh... Hablando sobre, sobre la libertad digital y, y toda, la conversa, bueno, toda la charla que estás dando, a mí me viene un tema a la cabeza ¿no? y es, es la educación eh, sobre este tema y sobre cómo podemos, sobre todo me gustaría saber qué reflexiones puedes tener en relación a la libertad digital hacia la educación, ¿no? qué, qué medidas se pueden tomar y qué, qué podemos hacer para, para que entiendan futuras generaciones que no es normal o no debería ser normal que, que se vea básicamente todo lo, todo lo que hacemos o todo lo que leemos en Internet. Good. Um, so I look a lot at public opinion polling around the world on these questions. Uh, and although uh, polling people who are age 12 to 15 or 17 is not very common in the world because they don't vote and they don't spend a lot of money, still we collect some public opinion data. Mr. Zuckerberg, of course, knows the world's 12-year-olds pretty well. Um, 
And, and one of the things which is very interesting to me uh, is that when you look at the data about young teenagers, people who were born uh, around the beginning of the 21st century, they are far more positive about Mr. Snowden than the surrounding opinion in their society, whatever it is. So in my country, for example, where people over the age of 18 do get involved in this hero traitor thing about Mr. Snowden, below age 18 there's no traitor thing. He's a hero pretty much only. And, and in every society in the world, whatever is the sort of age median view of Mr. Snowden, the, the young teenagers are much more positive. Now, I joke about this in, in, my, in my classroom by saying that the reason this is true uh, is that Edward Snowden has an enormously strong resemblance to Harry Potter. Um, <laughs> Yes, that's what happens. People laugh because they see. I mean, it's true. And I thought I was the only one who knew this, but as usual, I'm not as smart as I think I am. Mr. Snowden is far smarter than I am. Uh, and he gave an interview uh, to a magazine not long ago, and the magazine took the photo shoot in the Kremlin, where, of course, he gets good access, I gather, in one of those great big high windowed, smoky, mahogany paneled rooms of which the Kremlin is quite full. Um, and, and he evidently liked the chiaroscuro of this photograph. Uh, and he wrote underneath it a comment. He said, oh, it's very Harry Potter. And I thought, you know it too, don't you? <laughs> Um, but, 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 the, but the part of this that isn't pure popular culture analysis tells you that, in fact, uh, you've got some people on your side. Uh, in, in, in Berlin, again, I don't know why it is that, 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 that I, of all people, would give my major political speeches in Berlin, but, but I gave a talk in 2004 called Die Gedanken sind frei, which is a, a talk about the political theory of the free software revolution, uh, in which I said that those of us in my generation who work on technological freedom were really just keeping dinner warm until the kids come home. Uh, and the kids are coming home. Um, they are Mr. Snowden and younger, and, and they're coming home. There, there will be a moment in the early 2020s when those people are young consumers, and they will buy products that give them privacy. This is part of why Freedom Box is so important to me. I see a rendezvous with destiny when those young children grow up. Think of this in, in, in terms uh, that are also characteristic of other kinds uh, of social misuse. It's very often the case that younger siblings, they look up at their older brothers and sisters and they say, I'm never going to do that. Whether it's crack cocaine or it's Facebook, right? There's a, there's a sense that, yeah, I see. Those, those kids, the ones older than me, they have really screwed this up. I'm not going to do that. So I will tell you that I do believe there is a cultural backlash on that subject heading towards us from the tweens. I know lots of people who would deny this because, of course, they, they have teenagers and they see them using the stuff. Um, but, but, but with more doubt, with less overwhelming non-cynical narcissism than their older brothers and sisters who weren't born into the world of the net. That's the good news. Here's the bad news. I have a, a super bright friend who lives in California. She studies the internet as a professional scientist. She married late in life, another very smart person. And they had one of those children who sometimes arise from late life marriages and late life conception, a, a super bright at a super level. I, I met this young person when he was three years old. And um, by that time, he knew an awful lot about technology. His first word was iPad. This is not a good <laughs> outcome. Uh, uh, there's two things happening, in other words. Okay, there is a generational backlash against the over-monitoring in the net, and the, the Snowden revelations made a really big difference to those people. That's one of the first pieces of politics they ever saw that they cared about. But there also is a system, a system of education, in addition to everything else, yearning to turn them into users pushing Mr. Jobs' stuff at them, pushing Mr. Murdoch's stuff at them, reshaping education to be about using technology you don't control that watches you learn. Google used monitoring to change the world advertising business. 
Daphne Kohler, another very talented Stanford computer scientist, made Coursera to change the world labor market. The real meaning of the MOOC education platforms is if we study learning from the beginning of every human being's life, we can arbitrage the labor market better than anybody else because we can sell you a worker who is no smarter or better educated than you need at exactly the price you want to pay. I know a businessman in Korea, a very status conscious society, who deliberately recruits his workers from among the people who have performed well at low ranking technical schools. The first time I met him, he called this finding pearls in the mud. This is what computerized higher education on platforms that stretch all the way back to primary school is meant to do. It's meant to help businesses pay no more for workers than their cognitive endowment and particular educational performance justifies. So here too we are at a binary place, a zero one 21st century kind of place. Education will create opposition to the loss of freedom, or it will create hunger for the loss of freedom through convenience and better job getting, as Google creates demand for loss of freedom through the advertising of goods you didn't know you wanted until Google told you you might like this. Bueno, hay alguna alguien que se anime, alguien más? Tenemos, parece ser, una pregunta por Twitter, pero no alcanzo a verla. <risa> vale. Entonces, vuelvo a las mías, que yo tengo, la verdad es que tengo bastantes, no, no me dejan hacer todas, pero... Eh, en, en relación a lo que, a muchas de las preguntas que te han hecho, eh, una buena deducción sería, o correcta deducción sería, que a partir de ahora las guerras, bien, puede que sean por agua o por petróleo, pero van a ser por información. Parece ser, ¿no? En tanto a... Bien, me gustaría que pudieras eh, decir tu opinión en torno a esta idea que, bueno, que ya se suele leer en la academia y a ciertos autores, a cómo van a ser esas guerras del futuro basadas en, eh, en espionaje y en información, ¿no? Y no en tanto en materias primas. Bueno, well, so, let's take an example uh, that comes from the world of states confronting one another. The Chinese government broke into the personnel management system of the US government. They took the employment records and the security investigation records of a large number of, Europe, of American government employees, including the information submitted by those employees to get security clearances. In other words, the very sensitive information about those people's lives and behaviors that the United States government demands they turn over before giving them a security clearance. The Chinese took this uh, data by breaking into US government computers that were poorly secured and there was a lot of fuss and bother about it on the part of political leaders in the United States from Barack Obama down. But a former head of our intelligence community uh, testified publicly in Congress that this was from his point of view a perfectly valid target of a foreign system of espionage. He said, if I could have gotten into the Chinese personnel records, I would have done it in a second. They, it was a legitimate target. They were smarter than we were. Uh, I think that's true. Uh, at the A, that is, he would have done it. B, he's not the only one who would have done it. C, governments are going to do that all the time. That is to say, they're going to launch information attacks against one another's workers. Um, I was talking to a guy who was in the White House when all of that happened recently, and I, I said to him, why do you think it is that they didn't then take all that cloud services that was in the US Department of Interior, that's our land management ministry, why didn't they take it and put it in the Defense Department where they could have kept better control of it? He said, oh, that's easy, they didn't want the responsibility. So part of what is happening is that Info war between governments is A, something people don't want to prevent, 
B, they don't even want to prevent it if they have to take responsibility for what goes wrong, so that ministries that do security kick this in the direction of ministries that don't do security, and then they're shocked and appalled when somebody hits them, which they are all doing to one another as fast as they can. You know that part of the byplay between the German chancellor and the US administration over Snowden, while she was pretending to be outraged over the listening, was that the German government was taking over the enormous listening post and data dump that the US government maintains in Bavaria. They were, in effect, leasing back to her all that information about German people that they had been stealing. And it's not just German people either, it's also you, right? So, so another part of this is that from the point of view of governments, Infowar is trade. It really gets dealt with as trade. It may be hostile trade, but lots of trade is hostile, right? It may be a, a deal that nobody wants to make, but still you make the deals. We are, in effect, decreasing the ecological security of the planet as a whole because government's response to the information ecology of the world around them is explicitly cynical. They do not believe that what they are doing is protecting the integrity of the human mind. What they think they're doing is stealing information on one another's capabilities and intentions. They consider that to be legitimate. Indeed, they consider that to be necessary. This is why the transition to mass surveillance of entire societies has been both so easy and so wrong. As we moved from a period of bilateral confrontation between two superpowers to a world of what we called asymmetric warfare, which we now call terrorism, governments had more and more reason to spy on entire societies. Not just the nuclear missile launchers in the Russian submarines or the American ICBMs, not just one another's militaries, but one another's populations. So the primary problem that we experience when we think about info war is the absence of arms control. I said in the second Snowden lecture that I delivered in 2013 that the United States and the Soviet Union were able to agree on a nuclear test ban treaty. They were able to agree not to poison the atmosphere by testing nuclear weapons in the open air. They were able to agree. Remember, the French were not able to agree, but never mind. That, that only the Australians and the New Zealanders cared about that. So we were able to make arms control over nuclear weapons. Are we able to make arms control over info war? No sign of progress at all. No seriousness at all. Between the United States and China, let alone between the United States and the Tsarist Russia, not any progress at all. We are not even trying. You will know that the subject is of importance when we have stopped talking about cyber war and we have started talking about cyber peace. When we have started to talk about the end of aggression in the net, when governments have accepted that they are trying to seek a condition of peace in the net instead of a condition of war in the net. But the young theorists of cyber peace that I know around the world, many of them European, are essentially just crazy young people no politician is listening to right now. When you hear cyber peace instead of cyber war in the conversation of the important people, you will know that your question is being taken seriously by someone other than us sitting here now. Y una última pregunta, eh, como he dicho antes de Twitter, eh, es una pregunta de las redes sociales, Iben, es de Itziar García, y la pregunta es, ¿cuál sería el concepto de libertad al que debemos aspirar? I'm going to stay with the Isaiah Berlin I brought and say that no one conception will be correct. We need two. Uh, we need a clear understanding that we have a zone of privacy around ourselves as human beings which cannot be broken without destroying human nature. 
Our governments must agree to that. Every government has two responsibilities, therefore, to protect its citizens from spying by outsiders and to subject its own listening to the rule of law. If every government achieves those two responsibilities, it does not allow outsiders to attack the human nature of its citizens, and it recognizes the rule of law over its own listening, then we are mostly there. A few governments on Earth, mine, the Chinese, the Russian one, maybe the UK if it remains a United Kingdom, must decide also to stop spying on entire societies. They must adopt a new rule of international public law. Spying on entire societies is wrong. That's the freedom from that we need to protect the integrity of human personality. Now we must ask about the freedom to. Who governs us? Who determines what in a digital society we may become? And here, government response is also predictably based on the ideas that Isaiah Berlin set forward. It is not acceptable to force people to be free your way. It is not acceptable to make the idea of freedom that government positively proposes an idea it believes itself. So, we cannot have a concept of freedom, any concept of freedom, which is compatible with the formulation that Islam does not belong to Germany. We cannot have a form of freedom too, which assumes that there is a way to dictate the form of freedom people will have. The human race, as it is globalizing now, presents a broader challenge to any truly humble conception of the freedom too. Because as the human race moves about the surface of the world and changes the spatial distribution of languages, religions, and social practices, the tendency in human society is to reinforce our own values to reduce our humility in the face of the other, to reduce our willingness to accept that there are a lot of ways to be human and we cannot force a man to be free in our way. But the formulation of a freedom too, which is genuinely capable of humility, which does not say, as Viktor Orban says, that Hungary must be a country in Christian Europe, or that says that Islam has no place in X or Y or Z locale, this is a form of freedom too which leads to a bad place. In the world I grew up in, we had just finished watching somebody try and resolve the Jewish question. I wish they hadn't. I wish they had allowed themselves to believe that the Jewish question was a question that had no answer. We are watching people do that again and they must stop. There is no answer to the question, does Islam belong in Germany? There is no answer to the question, must we open our doors to those who are unfortunate in the extreme? There is no answer to these questions. We cannot force people to be free in their own way. The gravest problem is the problem of freedom too. Post-war European societies tried to take the benefit of peace by creating social welfare, by raising everybody's prosperity. It's a noble idea, but it won't last. And now it is beginning to suffer strain. And in that strain, like the strain in China that comes from trying to tell people getting rich is glorious, pay no attention to politics, is the weakness of traditional conceptions of the freedom too. Most governments on earth right now are not really interested in a rule yourself way of thinking about human development because all of them have a preference about how people should be free. This is inevitable. It is not possible both to grow a society in a planned or constructive way and to be completely humble about your own values. 
Isaiah Berlin in 1958 ended his essay on two conceptions of liberty by quoting Joseph Schumpeter to the effect that a society which can recognize that its values are only relatively right and that they are never right everywhere and for everybody or even right for it forever is a society which knows the difference between civilization and barbarism. I think that was too strong. I think Berlin made a mistake by believing so much in what Schumpeter had to say. So I would put it differently. Freedom involves inevitably the state's humility. A state without humility cannot accept the reality of freedom. Bueno, pues con, usted, con esta última reflexión nos quedamos. Eh, muchísimas gracias por esta interesante ponencia de intervención, Iben. Y antes de cerrar el acto, eh, quiero recordaros que el próximo, junio, eh, el próximo 30 de junio es la próxima, el próximo evento de European Dialogues y van a tomar parte, va a ser sobre el deporte y las identidades colectivas, y hablarán Xavi Alonso, Mayalen Churaut y John Carlin. Y con esto damos ya cierre al evento. Muchas gracias a todas y a todos por venir y también a los que habéis estado en casa viéndolo por streaming. Y muchas gracias sobre todo a Ivan Moglen.